Uh, hello everyone, I'm Zhu Wei Liu from East China Normal University at NYU Shanghai. Today my topic is Emergent Topological States via Digital via the one Oxide Superlattice. Oxide heterostructure exhibits many intriguing properties and searching for non troubled topological states have been one of the most active fields in condition matter physics and material science. Topological insulating states and topological metallic states have been intensively studied in narrow gap semiconductors whose electronic structure is dominated by S and P optors. In comparison, complex oxides with characteristic D optors have been less explored. An intriguing purpose is to study a bilayer of cross-gate oxide thin film along one one direction in which the transition matter atoms resides on a buckled honeycomb lattice. However, compared with one-on-one termination, the other one cross-gate oxide heterostructure is easy to synthesize. So we build the other one direction stacked cross-gate oxide one-on-one superlattice. The M and M pro are two dissimilar transition matter atoms and we perform first principles calculations to study it. Our design principles are based on few factors. First, maintain thermal same reversal symmetry and inversion symmetry. Second, control oxygen or cradial rotation and de optal occupancy. Third, construct the band inversion between de optals of two dissimilar transition metal atoms. This figure shows a schematic uh, density of, of states of 1 1 superlattice. We choose M to be a early transition matter atoms and uh, M pro to be a later transition matter atoms. Due to the electron activity difference, the deoptors of M have high energy than the deoptors of M pro. Given a proper combination of M and M pro, and their D occupancy. The M D bands and M pro D bands may overlap with each other around the forming level. When spin optical coupling is included, we can have two situations in which no trouble top topological state may emerge. If spin optical coupling can open a full gap between the highest valence bands and the lowest conduction bands, a topological insulator may emerge. If a linear closing is stabilized between the uh, MD bands and M pro D bands around the forming level, even in the presence of SOC, then it is possible to get a topological direct semi metal. Next, uh, we have two specific examples. First, uh, we choose tantalum and iridium to building the strontium tantalum oxygen and the strontium iridium oxygen 1 1 superlattice. Due to the cell doubling that is needed to accommodate the oxygen oxygen rotation, the total D occupancy of D1 plus D5, K612, which can be divided by 4, implying a possible insulating ground state. This figure shows the band structure of Warman superlattice without SOC. Tantalum D, due to the difference, uh, due to the electronic negativity difference, tantalum D optals have high energy than iridium D optal. And we find the highest valence bands and the lowest conduction bands from node surface in the horizon zone. This figure shows the band structure of 1-1 one -one superlattice with SOC. We can find a full gap is opened between the highest valence bands and the lowest conduction bands. So we want to know if it have, has non travel topological properties. Next, uh, we calculated the parity of eight time reversal in invariant momentum points. All the points have even parity, but except uh, Z point have odd parity. So the Z2 index of 1-1 one, one superlattice is 1, the other 1, which is a strong topological insulate. Next, we calculated the one the other surface and the other one surface. 
for the one zero zero surface, the crossing of surface band at the bar point occurs in the gap and close to the Fermi level. However, for the zero zero one surface, the crossing of surface bands at gamma bar point is very below the Fermi level, confirming that it is a strong topological insulate. Second example, we choose mobilium and iridium to build in strontium mobilium oxygen and strontium iridium oxygen 11 superlatives. Due to the CO doubling that is needed to accommodate the oxygen oxygen rotation, the total D occupancy of D2 plus D5 case is 14. It must have a gap layer system with one band half view when the total D occupancy is 14. This figure shows the band structure of 11 superlattes with SOC. We can find the highest valence bands and the lowest conduction bands have band crossing at gamma QZ and from a drug point. The drug point near a formula level. And this drug point emerging in pairs and only along gamma to Z pass because of the combination of thermal reversal, inversion, and C4 rotation symmetries. And we can also find the formula level crossing a drug node line. This drug node line is protected by non symmetric symmetry together with the thermal reversal inversion symmetry. This figure shows the surface band along P bar to Z bar. We can find there are two Fermi arc emerging from the projection of drug point. And they will terminate at the projection of the other drug point. In our calculations, we find epitaxial string can tune the banner inversion and control the number of drug point. We find when the superlattice is under 1% compressive string, there is one drug point. When the superlattice is under 2% compressive string, there are two drug points. But when the superlattice is under 3% compressive string, there are no drug point. So we made more accurate calculations and, uh, and find from 2% percent tensile string to 1.7 compressive string. The 1-1 one -one superlattices have one pair of drug point. In a narrow compressive string range, the superlattices have two pair of, of drug point. When a compressive string exceeds 2.7%, the superlattices doesn't have drug point. Finally, we find the strontium molybdenum oxygen and strontium Iridium oxygen 11 superlattice have multiple coexisting topological states, including topological insulate and topological direct semimetal. The figure left shows the band structure of 11 superlattice. We find the highest valence bands and the lowest conduction bands have band crossing. This leads us to the aforementioned TDS state. And the highest valence bands and the second highest valence bands as well as the lowest conduction bands and the second lowest, lowest conduction bands doesn't have band crossing. And the gap between them turns out to be topologically non trouble with the two index 1, the other is 1. This leads us to the TI state. The figure right shows the, the other 1, the other projected surface band of 1, 1 superlattice. The reader highlights the projection of uh, surface band. We can find the TDS surface direct cone is sandwiched between the two TI surface direct cone in the energy momentum space. In summary, we find the strontium tantalum oxygen and the strontium iridium oxygen 11 superlattice exhibits a strong topological insulating state with Z2 index 1, Z1. The strontium molybdenum oxygen and strontium iridium oxygen 11 superlattice is a topological drug semimetal with drug point and drug load line. The strontium, strontium molybdenum oxygen and strontium iridium oxygen 11 superlattice have multiple ex coexisting topological states, including topological insulate and topological drug semimetal. 
and we believe when more correlated D optors are involved, other topological states may emerge, such as quantum anomalies hall and fractional quantum hall. Thank you for my advisor, Professor Hang Huichen. Thank you for Professor Dang Li, Hong Quan Liu, Jia Jima, and Xiao Xuan Wang. Thank you for NYUHPC. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Does the audience have any questions for the two-minute Q&A period? Thank you for that very nice talk. Um, our next presenter is Zhidong Zhang from Ergon National Laboratory. Are you here? Yes, I am. Can you speak up a little bit? Your mic's a little low. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, just be closer to your mic. I think that's a bit. Let's try sharing your screen. Uh, all right. Am I up? Yes, I would just make your slides full screen if you can. All right, let me move the windows around. All right, uh, good morning. So I'd like to talk to you, uh, tell you about the uh, large, very large spin hole conductance in thin films of the A15 phase tantalum antimonide. Let me turn on my uh, laser pointer. So uh, tantalum antimonide belongs to the family of A15 superconductors that have long been known as high field superconductors. Very recently, it's been predicted to have a giant spin hole effect because of the spin orbit coupling induced gaps at the band crossing near the Fermi level and the eight fold de uh, de degeneracy. Tandem 3 antimonide has also been predicted to have topological surface states and a non helical spin texture. From the binary alloy phase diagram of tandem antimony, uh, the A15 structure is stable in a composition range near uh, where the antimony composition is less than 20%, not the uh, nominal 25%. Uh, very recently, Chapai and co-workers synthesized pure tantalum antimonide bulk powders. They found that their composition is also antimony deficient, around uh, four tantalum to one antimonide. Uh, from Rietveld refinement, they found uh, signs of uh, tantalum, tantalum antimonide uh, site mixing. And by pressing their powder into a pellet, they were able to measure the resistivity. And the powders have very high resistivity, but they are metallic. Because of the porosity of the, of, of the powders, it's not possible to make a useful device. So we uh, synthesized tantalum antimonide thin films by co sputtering from elemental tantalum and antimony sources. The X-ray diffraction pattern shows all the tantalum antimonide peaks in the right places. And the film is a polycrystalline. There is no uh, impurity peaks. From reflectivity, the films appear fairly smooth on the, with a roughness on the order of half a nanometer. From Rutherford backscatter and spectrometry, we determine the composition to be, again, around four, four to one instead of three to one. So we measured the uh, tra charge transport property of these thin films. These thin films have lower resistivity than bulk powder on the order of 180 microohm centimeter. Um, but 
uh, different from the bulk powder, we do see a negative temperature coefficient of resistivity, meaning that the resistivity increases with, when you decrease the temperature. The superconducting phase, tra phase transit diagram shows that the film goes superconducting at around 877 millikelvin with the upper critical field greater than one Tesla. So these films have very small magnetic resistance, uh, less than half a percent at a field up to 14 Tesla. At higher temperatures, the magnetic resistance even, even smaller, less than 0.1%. Uh, we also measured the hole resistance of these films. The hole resistance is very small, indicating a very high carrier density. And the carrier density increases with temperature. The hole resistance is positive, meaning that the majority of carriers are hole type. To probe the spin hole effect in these films, we use the harmonic hole response technique. We pattern our bilayer structure of 85 nanometer tantalum antimonide and two nanometer permaloy into a hole bar. Uh, in the lower left bottom panel, we show the anomalous hole effect of this hole bar structure. It's a very simple hard axis loop because uh, the field is out of plane. The saturation magnetization is the same as the demagnetization field from the in-plane magnetization, which is uh, 4 pi MS, and it's exactly 10, er uh, 10, uh, 10 kilo Ersted, as we expect from permaloy, meaning that our mag uh, permaloy is, is in-plane magnetized. Um, to probe the spin hall effect with second harmonic, when you apply a current in the uh, tantalum antimonide, the current drives a, a, a spin current into a ferromagnet. This produces a spin orbit torque that have two components, the field-like uh, term and the damping-like term. These, when the uh, current is AC, these spin orbit torques causes the magnetization to oscillate around its equilibrium position this leads to a second harmonic in the uh, hole resistivity. And when you rotate the applied in-plane magnetic field with respect to the current direction, there will be characteristic angular dependence in the second harmonic response. On the right-hand panel, I show the measurement of the both uh, first harmonic and second harmonic re uh, hole resistivity. The first harmonic is just the planar hole effect. It shows a sine two phi um, dependence, whereas the second harmonic is much more complex. And depending on the applied external field, it evolves from a tri-peak behavior to a cosine uh, phi behavior. This is because the second harmonic um, Hall response have uh, has both the damping-like term and uh, the uh, field-like term, they each have different characteristic angular dependence. The first being the uh, cosine phi dependence, the other being cosine phi times cosine two phi dependence. And there's also the uh, thermoelectric and Ersted field con contribution. By fitting the, uh, the, the, the second harmonic uh, response curves we, I just showed previously, we can actually extract the contribution from the respective terms. And here I plot the uh, damping-like term and uh, the uh, uh, thermoelectric term as a function of one over field plus a DMAC field. From fitting the, the curve, we get a, a damping-like field to be about 260 Ersted, whereas the field-like field is about one Ersted. Keep in mind that uh, this current density we use is about uh, 1.8 times 10 to the 10th m per square meter. That's about one tenth of the typical current density that people use for second harmonic response. So this is a huge uh, damping like field. By doing this at different current densities, we can find the, uh, the uh, spin orbit torque field as a function of the current density. And it's a linear dependence. The slope shows efficiency of the current 
uh, of the spin orbit torque as 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 the uh, um, current density changes. So what we get is 146 Earthsec per 10 to the 10th n uh, square meter. Plugging these numbers into the expression for the uh, spin or spin orbit torque efficiency or spin a spin hole angle, we get. Uh, a spin torque efficiency for spin uh, for tantalum antimony to be about seven, whereas the spin uh, hole conductance is about thirty eight thousand. Now pause for a moment. Just think about the numbers. In theory, the tantalum antimony is pretty to have a spin hole conductance of, of negative twenty eight hundred. So what we measure is about ten times bigger than what the theory predicts. In the sign, it's opposite. So these are comparable actually to uh, topological sem uh, semiconductors, bismuth selenide, which are uh, due to the uh, spin, open, uh, spin momentum locking at the surface states. So to summarize, we've, sum we've prepared thin films of A15 tantalum antimonide by sputter deposition. Our films are phase pure, but they're off stoichiometry from the nominal 3.1 or 3 to 1. And our films have negative TCR, they're superconducting. They have high carrier density, but the higher the carriers are a whole type. And what's interesting is that we found extremely large spin orbit torque efficiency that are um, in par on par with the uh, topological uh, uh, insulators. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice talk. Um, while we wait for any attendees to populate a question in the virtual Q&A tab, um, do, do any of our other presenters who are in the Zoom room have a question? Okay, thank you for that um, very nice talk. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Um, our next presenter is um, Gregory, the Gregory Lappet from Harvard University. Gregory, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Great. Um, I hear you fine. If you want to try sharing your screen. Perfect. And we see your slides. Ready to start? Yes, sir. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Gregory Lapete, and I'm an undergrad studying at Harvard University. Today, I'll be sharing with you my project of the precursor inlet for metal organic molecular beam epitaxy of tungsten ditelluride. Before I begin, I would like to give thanks and credit to Kevin Hauser Christian Matt, Jason Hoffman, and Jennifer Hoffman for their contributions to this project. Let us begin. So what is tungsten ditelluride and why are we so interested in it? Tungsten ditelluride belongs to the class of transition metal dichalcogenides or TMD materials. TMD materials are composed of transition metals and calcogen atoms. In our case, the tungsten here displayed in black is the transition metal and in yellow is fluorium, the calcogen atoms. Together, these form a 2D chemical structure and formed as a monolayer exhibits physical properties that we are interested in. TMD materials and monolayer tungsten ditelluride exhibit properties of topological insulation. On the figure here on the right, you can see a microwave impedance microscopy image, which shows localized conductance along the edges of the monolayer tungsten ditelluride and insulation on the center. This is evidence of a topological insulator and we're interested in it because of its applications in quantum computing. Tungsten ditelluride can act as a platform for fault, for fault tolerant quantum computing. Seen here on the bottom left is the energy spectra in a cylinder geometry of the edge state of monolayer tungsten ditelluride. Without pairing, there exists a helical edge state which traverses the bulk gap. However, if we pair this monolayer tungsten ditelluride with a high temperature superconductor, we can see that the edge state then becomes gapped. We theorize that this forms major armor cream repairs on the four corners of the monolayer tungsten ditelluride. So now that we have the motivation for tungsten ditelluride, how do we create it? It has a couple of deposition techniques, one of them being chemical vapor deposition. 
or CVD. Chemical vapor deposition is a process that we heat a low vacuum chamber up to the reaction temperature of a volatile precursor. The chamber is heated to the reaction temperature and the precursor reacts and breaks down into the desired coating onto the material surface. Over time, the coating material builds up and creates this tungsten ditelluride. We favor CVD because of its low stoichiometric variability compared to other deposition methods. Compared to other deposition methods, you are very likely to obtain tungsten ditelluride rather than any other formation of your materials. However, because it is only performed in a low vacuum environment, there is a higher defect density because there is more atmosphere in the way of your deposition. The other deposition technique which we employ is molecular beam epitaxy, which, or MBE. MBE is, empl is employed in an ultra high vacuum environment, therefore it does not suffer from these same defect densities that CVD does. However, in our case, we use tungsten which has a very high melting point. Uh, this requires that we use electron beam evaporators and this increases the flux instability of the system and creates islands in our monolayer film, which is not ideal. So how do we solve this? We solve this by implementing a metal organic precursor in conjunction with a molecular beam epitaxy. This is the same image from the previous slide, and you can see the same flux instability and island generation. However, it has been shown that performing MBE in conjunction with metal organic precursors decreases the flux instability and decreases island generation. This is because tungsten on its own tends to be very sticky at uh, low temperatures and does not stick to the surface of the material at high temperatures. This problem doesn't come into play when you're dealing with molecules. For our experiment, we use tungsten hexacarbonyl, and this reduces the metal sticking coefficient and reduces the nucleation density, as well as enhancing the growth kinetics. So now that we have our metal organic precursor, how do we bring it into the ultra high vacuum system? Typically, we do this through fusion cells. However, this metal organic precursor has an extremely high vapor pressure. The fusion cells which heat up the material will have trouble controlling the dosage that you're depositing onto your substrate. As well, the fusion cell sits inside of the MB system, meaning that the precursor will constantly be exposed to this high vacuum pressure and will often sublimate out of your system and be pumped out when you don't want it to, making it of no use to you. To solve this, we create an external UHV precursor system. This solves the problem of the UHV constantly being exposed to the ultra high vacuum pressure. However, it does not solve our problem of how we deposit it onto our substrate for growing tungsten ditelluride. So how do we control this? We implement a high dosage valve, a high precision dosage valve to control the sublimation of tungsten hexacarbyl into our system. This is a picture of our system here. And you can see that we implement the external precursor system below. This again prevents the unintended sublimation of the precursor into our system and allows the deposition to occur without an effusion cell. Here you can see the high precision leakage valve. This allows us to tune the flux and leak rate of the precursor into our system and to grow our tungsten ditelluride. Because of its high vapor pressure, we also need to control where the precursor sublimates and condensates. We do this through localized heating and heating up a water bath to the place where the precursor is stored to prevent condensation and control where it sublimates. Here we can see an image of how the outside external precursor system connects to the inside. It funnels through the needle tubing into the UHV system directly to the growth site or material. Okay, so now we can take a look at the outcomes of this, of this precursor system. Here is a graph showing the, a scan of a res residual gas analyzer. The residual gas analyzer scans the entire system and sees what elements and which atomic mass is present in the system. On the left, you can see the pressure and or the amount of each mass in the system. For UHV, we typically stay at around minus eight torr, so that is where you see all the peaks. To, get, to give you some bearings, here we can see the hydrogen sitting around two AMU, H2I 18, 
uh, nitrogen and carbon monoxide at 28 and CO2 at 44. You can also note that we see the tellurium isotopes in our system from previous growths being picked up by the RGA. You can also see ditellurium. Now let's open the inlet and see what, see what shows up. You can see large spikes throughout the entire graph, and we begin labeling these. You can see the isotopes of tungsten from the precursors begin to show up in the system around 180 and 185 AMU. You can see that it also reacts with carbon and carbon monoxide and its respective peaks. It is also important to note that you see a spike of carbon monoxide compared to previous. So, in conclusion, the metal organic precursor of tungsten hexacarbyl has difficulties when presented with the UHV system because of its ultra high vapor pressure and the inability to use standard diffusion cells. However, we solved this problem by implementing an external precursor system and a high precision dosage valve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, there are no questions yet in the virtual chat. Um, we have two, Anon and um, Mr. Zhang are still here as other presenters in the virtual Zoom room. Do you, either of you have a question for Gregory? Okay, I'm sorry we are greeted with crickets. Um, <laughs> but thank you again for the very nice talk. We are going into a break because it does not appear that our next presenter, Keshav Shrishta from West Texas A&M has joined us yet, but should that person join us, we will start again immediately. So 10 minute break, everyone. Thank you. Okay, everyone, um, we are going to start our next presentation. Um, our next um, presentation is by Kuile Li, I hope I said that correctly, from Monash University. If you're ready to share your slides and unmute. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, and we can see your slides as well. Thank you. Oh, great, great. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Chile from Monash University in uh, Australia. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, our recent work um, on the manganese basement telluride using scanning tunneling microscope. Um, so the topic is to imaging the breakdown and the restoration of the topological protection in the uh, magnetic topological insulator MBT or manganese bismuth telluride. Um, so first I'm going to start with some um, brief introduction to the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Um, so quantum anomalous Hall effect is uh, one of the trials uh, for the in the quantum hole family. So in the quantum hole effect, you, uh, in this strong field, you have this uh, chiral edge state, state moving around the edge of the material while the bulk remains insulating. Uh, this edge has some uh, good properties such as uh, dissipationless transport. Um, then in the quantum spin hole effect, um, you, the spin optical coupling sort of replace the role of the uh, magnetic field. So now you have a spin momentum locked uh, edge state. And this edge state is sort of uh, robust against uh, backscattering. Then in the quantum normal's Hall effect, uh, you don't need a external magnetic field. In, uh, instead, it's replaced by spontaneous uh, magnetization. 
uh, and now the time reversal symmetry is broken, so there's only um, one edge state uh, channel instead of two. And uh, you can use the quantum norms Hall effect to do many amazing uh, things. So for example, you can uh, engineer next generation lossless transistors using the uh, dissipationless uh, edge state, or you can uh, engineer some spintronics uh, by using the uh, highly spin polarized uh, edge state, or you can do more uh, fancy things uh, like doing some uh, quantum uh, topological quantum computing. So the experimental demonstration of quantum uh, normalized Hall effect, it's first uh, discovered in 2013-ish. Uh, um, so it's uh, in this uh, chromium-doped uh, bismuth telluride uh, alloy. It was uh, observed at really low temperature, like 30 millikelvin. Uh, in this system, basically, there are many, many um, magnetic impurities throughout the material, and the magnetic gap is uh, quite small. Also, this system suffers from magnetic disorder, which results in uh, scattering in the uh, edge state transport. So this sort of uh, limits the operating temperature to uh, very low. Um, later, a layered compound called the manganese bismuth steroid was discovered. In this layered compound, it has uh, layer-dependent topological uh, properties and the magnetic properties. So each uh, interlayers are coupled antiferromagnetically. So whenever you have an odd layer, there's an uncompensated layer. And uh, quantum normal's whole effect uh, was observed in a five-layer uh, flakes and uh, up to 1.4 Kelvin which has, uh, the temperature has been improved to compare with the dilute magnetic of the TI. However, um, the quantum normal's whole effect in, in the manganese bismuth telluride is supposed to uh, exist uh, up to the new temperature, which is, which is 23 Kelvin. Uh, however, I uh, remember the previous slide, it's only uh, recorded up to 1.4 Kelvin. Also, in their experiment, they found the external magnetic field is required to boost the uh, uh, quantum lumbus hold uh, effect. In principle, the magnet uh, magnetic uh, disorder shouldn't be a problem in this layered compound because the magnetic order is incorporated into the lattice. Uh, so we would expect a much um, weaker magnetic disorder. So to understand this, we need a technique with a very good uh, spatial and energy resolution to understand the electronic property uh, microscopically. So in this work, we use scanning tunneling microscopy to investigate uh, the role of magnetic disorder and how it's interplay with the uh, topological states. So first, um, I start with some uh, atomic resolution uh, topography scans on the surface. This is uh, taken on a uh, to race. So from this uh, overview, you can see there are many, many defects. And one of the defects um, is these uh, dark triangles. And those are identified as uh, manganese bismuth uh, defects. And for those really bright spots, they are the uh, bismuth telluride uh, defects. On the right, uh, I show a some at atomic um, it, structure image um, to really show you what those uh, defects mean. So for example, this manganese bismuth defect, it means in the second layer, a bismuth atom is replaced by a manganese atom, uh, while the bismuth telluride, uh, no, bismuth tellurium uh, defect, it means on the surface, a tellurium atom is replaced by a bismuth atom. Uh, then we have performed STS measurements on the same terrace, uh, but uh, um, very right from the edge to make sure there's no contribution from the edge state. And even from the same terrace, we found there's a huge variation of the band gap. Um, so for example, the blue one is almost gapless, while the green and the uh, red, they are uh, quite gapped. And compared with the previous uh, office uh, measurements, 
And we found this band gap fluctuates. Um, and um, this fitting in the archive, uh, sorry, in the RPS uh, spectrum, it's basically, uh, you, you find there's a really high intensity in the gap region. And um, this intensity could come from the band gap fluctuation uh, spatially. So for example, this band gap in the uh, green curve, uh, it can be used to fit this uh, green dispersion and for the, uh, sorry about the shift here. Uh, so the red one also could be fitted with this uh, band gap. So uh, what's really happening in this system? Uh, we'll start from uh, some measurements on the edge state. So first, uh, I performed a topography scan on the four layer to five layer edge. So on this edge, because the four layer, uh, the churn number is zero, while the five layer has a churn number of one, which means uh, there should be an edge state appearing on the uh, terrain across this edge. Uh, then ideally in the bulk, the for a quantum anomalous hole insulator, it should be really insulating. Um, while uh, as you move uh, towards the edge, uh, there should be some dots or density states from the edge state. And uh, these are the two STS curves we obtained uh, at those two points. So you can see for the purple one, there's a quite a big gap, like 60 MeV, uh, while the red one uh, has some dots uh, near the zero bias. And remind you in the classical picture of the um, quantum normal soil effect, so the uh, chiral edge states, electrons, they should move around the edge uh, while the bulk remains insulating. And this uh, edge state uh, should be quite robust against uh, backscattering. Then we performed a, a constant uh, height dot map. This allows us to extract the spatial distribution of the edge state. So, on the left is the edge of this uh, this terrace, and you can see there is a quite sharp edge state uh, evidence of the edge state. Um, but at the, in the same time, you you also have this really high intensity uh, metallic state. And what's concerning is uh, part of these uh, metallic states. It's also coupled to the edge state, and um, this means uh, when you're doing the when you're doing the transport measurements, uh, if you turn the Fermi into the uh, edge state, um, then there's a uh, quite a bit scattering from this edge state into those extended states and causing the uh, heat dissipation. Uh, so this could be the problem um, that we're having. And if we plus a dos. Uh, like away from the edge in the bulk, you can see some of it's still, uh, it's also metallic. Um, and this is uh, a DOS uh, line profile, and uh, you can see there are uh, the contribution from the disordered or extended metallic states and the edge states. They kind of mix up together. So um, this is quite bad. Um, then we have to find out uh, where those metallic states come from. So we start with some uh, uh, STS maps uh, uh, around the defects. So the first the defect is manganese species defect, the stock triangles. Um, then we measure STS curve at each point on a grid. Um, so from this STS, we can extract the band gap and also the uh, center of the band gap, uh, which basically means uh, to the right, you can see a schematic of the band structure. And it allows us to tell uh, the doping shift from the uh, EC. And uh, just to remind you, this uh, manganese species defect is uh, in the second layer. And this is a band gap uh, map we extracted from our measurements. And uh, you could see some uh, defects from those uh, map, but there's something modulating the uh, band gap uh, on a large scale. So there's something else. Uh, then another type of defect we found is the bismuth manganese defect, which basically means in the center layer, the, one of the manganese atoms is replaced by a bismuth atom. Um, and similarly, uh, 
Uh, oh, sorry. What's different from the previous defect is this defect only show up at positive bias, as a really uh bright triangles. And if we perform the same measurement around one of the triangles, we found um there is also something else uh contributing to those dots. So um again, this defect doesn't really contribute to the band gap fluctuation. Then finally, we perform a band gap fluctuation measurement uh, over a larger scale within uh, and without a magnetic field. So from the same spot, we found there is a band gap opening of about 40 MeV. Um, then we perform this um, band gap uh, map. So, and those are four points with uh, some STS curves. And you can find the black one has the conduction band or electron band sort of uh, suppressed. Uh, while the blue one, the green and the red, they sort of uh, have this uh, direct like um, STS curve. So to extract the band gap, we need to exclude the regions uh, we suppress the um, conduction band intensity. So I mask in black. Then we perform the same measurement analysis at uh, in the field with uh, of one Tesla, and we found there's a uh, increase of the band, band gap average from 26 to 44 uh, with and without field. So this tells us the magnetic disorder can be reduced by even just one Tesla magnetic field. So basically, Lee, um, yeah. in fairness to the other presenters, you have hit time. But so if you want to share your conclusions and then we can go to Q&A. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, sure. So we've um, observed the band gap uh, fluctuation from the band gap to 100 MeV. There's signature of edge state coupled to the extended box state in the sample. So we show evidence of the magnetic disorder responsible for the band gap fluctuation. And uh, apparently this magnetic disorder is not really robust against, um, sorry, this intrinsic more order is not robust against the disorder. So still need to overcome the magnetic disorder. Uh, so check our check out our paper on the archive, and uh, I would like to give my acknowledgement to my supervisor and uh, our collaborators. And thank you. Okay, we did have a question um, from Luis Martinez in the virtual audience, and that is: Is there a publication on this work or a reprint? Uh, it's it's still a preprint. Uh, it's currently on the review. Um, okay. that, does that answer your question? That answered his question, and I'm sorry I said reprint instead of preprint. I didn't have my glasses on. Um, second question. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just scrolled up on yeah, me. Yeah, thanks. Give me one second. Can you show the link again? Evidently, you had a link to the preprint maybe, or the publication? Um, yeah, I've uh, attached the link uh, to the, um, in, in the, in the platform. Uh, so there's a, we uploaded this to archive. Um, so maybe I can uh, share the link if you want. It's not officially published yet. Um, Did you share that in the document section, you think? Yes, um, yes. I when do. you upload it? Okay. So audience, if you click on the abstract for Mr. Lee and you scroll down, I believe you will see the link where you can access this, I believe. If not, um, there is a messaging system in the virtual platform and perhaps you could send him a message and he could send it to you directly. Very good questions, Mr. Martinez. It's always good to share work. Are there any other questions perhaps? Um, Anand, do you have a question? I see you're still here as a presenter. Um, no, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Um, our next presenter um, does not appear to be in the session, but I have to give 10 minutes in case our attendees are jumping around to different talks. So we will return in 10 minutes for our final presentation by Anand Sakar. Sakar. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, everybody for your patience, especially um, Mr. Sakar, um, for waiting. Um, we are now at our final presentation.
from Anand Sakar from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Um, with that, if you can unmute and share your screen. Yeah, sure. So, uh, hello, uh, I would actually like to present it in a slightly different way. Uh, uh, so, I would actually be uh, uh, presenting the video that I have recorded uh, at the same time. So, yeah, so then I would like to start. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anand Bari Shorkar. Uh, I'm currently working as a postdoctoral researcher at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. I will be presenting uh, today my seminar uh, with the title as First Principle Exploration of Magnetism and Topology. Uh, before I proceed, I would like to thank uh, Professor Ron Bansin, Professor Avai Karantika, Professor Jairaman Shengalu, and Professor Jairasan for all the support. Uh, but before I proceed um, in my presentation, I would like to uh, give a brief outlook as far as my work with experimental physics as well as what my you know, with my theoretical physics are concerned uh, and i would like to present these things in a particular direction um, and these things i will uh, keep on uh, telling as i progress in my uh, seminar uh, to start with i would like to uh, start with uh, like electron beam lithography and like uh, preparation of transcription junction, my work with geometrically infrastructure systems uh, and also uh, my theoretical work with uh, different hall systems like uh, uh, work with uh, topologically um, uh, non-trivial systems, now bringing magnetism within the close proximity of a topologically insulating systems and how in the overall topological property will change, uh, that will also be of utmost importance. Uh, I mean, uh, these things are there and we are, um, I mean, I have worked uh, uh, with uh, these things um, to find different new properties. Uh, so, uh, so regarding this, I would like to highlight uh, the you know, uh, work of uh, Amit, uh, Amit Pichar published, uh, I mean, two of our published work titled as K2COS2, two-dimensional anti-ferromagnetic insulators, and other ones titled as magnetic neutral neutral and oil uh, fermions in digital nutrients family. Uh, these things I'll be discussing as I, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in my upcoming slides. Uh, to start with, I would um, like to just briefly uh, discuss things related to uh, like uh, things related to superconducting quantum interface devices, uh, 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 like with two substance junction uh, in my work with two substance junction, the preparation, uh, different ways of to prepare two substance junction uh, things are concerned, uh, like why two substance junction are important. And I mean, I would like to connect this uh, work as I've been mentioning that my experimental work along with theoretical work uh, along a particular direction as I, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, this is what I'm trying to do actually. Uh, so, and then my work with uh, geometrically frustrated systems, uh, uh, like, uh, so I have also worked with geometrically frustrated systems where mainly with the, uh, within the frame of our neutron diffraction study to find out uh, different uh, new, uh, like, uh, I mean, uh, to find out different new magnetic, uh, configuring magnetic structures and things are concerned. So these things are there. Uh, so before, because uh, I mean, uh, so, so I, I just like to connect, uh, like for example, my work with um, Joseph's injunctions, uh, preparing weak links, followed by my work with uh, geometric infrastructure systems, within the framework of neutron diffraction study and things are concerned and then followed by my uh, work with theoretical physics. So I started working with uh, two-dimensional magnetic systems, uh, two-dimensional magnetic systems uh, and like, uh, and while discussing about two-dimensional magnetic systems, um, the concept of spatial dimension, concept of space, spin dimension would be our utmost importance uh, as far as finding a long-range magnetic order um, is concerned. Uh, so um, regarding this, um, I mean uh, the I mean the manifestation. I mean people um, people were observing um, long range magnetic order uh, in low dimensional magnetic systems uh, experimentally. As, I mean uh, from the perspective of experimental physics are concerned. Um, I mean followed by and then like people have also observed like uh, low dimensional uh, magnetic topology and man, uh, exploration of magnetism topology in low dimensional systems. Let's say. 
So how uh, like uh, topological properties or the magnetic properties can be tuned based on different uh, parameters? Uh, so these things are also there, which is also of uh, most importance. Uh, regarding this, I would like to mention two of our papers, titled as K2CS2, two-dimensional imprint and chromatic insulator, and magnetic tunability rather than fermions in the gentle materials family. Uh, Regarding um, our paper with K2S2, uh, a two-dimensional implant chromatic insulator, and the main um, uh, idea was like, uh, why anti-ferromagnetism? Uh, why should we be choosing anti-ferromagnetism over ferromagnetism? And uh, why? Uh, what are the benefits of having anti-ferromagnetism? So anti-ferromagnetic uh, materials are better than ferromagnets as far as because ferromagnets react to external magnetic fields. It is necessary to shield these materials from unwanted magnetic fields. Uh, Antiferromagnetic materials are not influenced by magnetic fields. Antiferromagnetic magnets are magnetically more robust and can in principle be switched much faster than ferromagnets. Um, then um, I would like to discuss things regarding now the inclusion of topology and then uh, the discussion of magnetic topology and things are concerned. So uh, to start with, I would like to actually discuss uh, the phase transitions uh, mostly, I mean, you, you see some or the other. So for example, I already have a topology with non-trivial systems, let's say I have bi 2 t 3 which shows a particular type of topological behavior. Now, if I change the direction of the magnetic moments, if I change the orientation of the magnetic moments, how these things will change, how these things will behave, we, this will be of utmost importance. Um, and at the same time, if I change now the, um, I mean, I mean, in one hand, I have been mentioning things regarding the direction of the magnetic moment, uh, where um, changing the direction of the magnetic moment will change the topological properties. At the same time, if I change the uh, concentration of particular uh, of doping concentration in a particular systems, how that will uh, change the topological properties, how that will uh, give us different phase transition, that is also what most important. Uh, I mean, uh, so uh, now at the same time, orientation of the magnetic moments and how these things will be oriented uh, will also be uh, will also play an important role. Uh, like um, uh, so, like if I if I if I keep on rotating the magnetic moments, uh, then how these things will change, how these things will behave. We, this will also be of utmost uh, importance. Um, now, rational design principle of uh, the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Uh, in super in super lattice, uh, in super lattice magnetic topological insulators. So this is another way of uh, discussing uh, magnetic top. Uh, for example, uh, how to design a particular material systems. Like if I design a particular material systems, uh, the, how that will, uh, I mean, uh, behave or uh, how the topological properties of the overall systems uh, will change. Uh, it will, that will also be of uh, uh, utmost importance. Um, like if I uh, if I if I place uh, material material systems in T orbital along uh, with a material system P orbital, and then how these things will change how this things will behave, you know, these things will be of uh, most importance uh, as far as uh, designing these principles are concerned. Um, so, and at the same time, uh, so regarding this, I would like to mention the three tend to magnetic Dirac and well fermions in the genital and the materials family and things are concerned. Uh, so, yeah. Now I would like to discuss uh, the application part of uh, magnetic topology. So I would like to connect, like I have started, um, I have discussed uh, my work with uh, experimental work with um, preparing Joseph Sin junctions, preparing weak links, followed by my work with, uh, uh, I mean, exploring um, uh, complicated magnetic structure within the framework of neutron diffraction study, and followed by my work with two-dimensional magnet, I mean, low-dimensional magnetic systems, low-dimensional magnetic topology uh, topological systems uh, phase transition as far as uh, working with uh, magnetically uh, i mean magnetic topological systems are concerned i would like to discuss uh, things like the application of magnetic topology uh, so uh, the application of magnetic topology is vast uh, actually uh, as far as i have already mentioned the anti systems uh, can be the uh, utmost importance as compared to the ferromagnetic systems uh, manipulating exchange bias by screen or we talk i mean uh, as far as uh, enhanced mobile where broadband technologies are sponsored, 
Uh, I mean, uh, from the good implementation, um, as far as um, different um, medical science are concerned, so these things are there. Um, I mean, uh, I, I mean, uh, as far as working with defense and military intelligence are concerned, working with, uh, I mean, uh, preparing heterostructures, uh, I mean, preparing heterostructures, and then, uh, I mean, uh, uh, like, preparing it with structures and then combining these things and then finding out meaningful results from here and which will be of utmost importance as far as, uh, as uh, preparing different uh, I mean, uh, as far as the application part of magnetic like, topological systems are uh, concerned. Uh, then there are uh, another way of uh, saying like quantum computing and then there are uh, like uh, using the concept of uh, phase transitions within top, uh, topological uh, non-trivial systems and then uh, enhancing these ideas uh, like topological, I mean titled as, I mean they have the papers like topological quantum phase transition from mirror to time reverse insulated protected uh, topological insulating systems, switching by topological insulators. So uh, these are the areas where uh, magnetic topological systems will be of utmost importance. Um, I mean, as I have also mentioned, like medical research, uh, the concept of activity devitalizations, concept of um, magnetism, and these things can be of utmost important as far as medical research which are concerned uh, and I would like to discuss things with my future roadmap that uh, we are currently working on uh, like exploration of magnetic topology in board action systems. As I mentioned earlier as well, like I have worked, uh, I would like to just connect that I have worked with um, uh, like uh, as far as proprietary Josephson junctions, working with uh, finding different uh, complicated magnetic structure within the frame of monitor diffraction study, exploring magnetism in low dimension. These things are there. So, exploring magnetism topology in load and systems are concerned. Uh, so, these things um, are there. So, like different tunable properties can be observed uh, as far as magnetism, as far as magnetic topology systems are concerned, because finding long range magnetic order in a load and systems uh, is always, I mean, uh, I, mean uh, I mean, it, 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 I mean, something to, um, very important. Uh, exploring magnetic topology uh, in heterostructure systems, like preparing a different structure and then uh, finding a combination and then uh, and then uh, working uh, with this uh, along a particular direction will be of utmost importance um, the expression of magnetic topology in proximity induced effect uh, like I already have a topological non trivial systems uh, now bringing in magnetism. Uh, topology, I, I have a topological non trivial system now bringing in magnetism within the close proximity of a topologically uh, non trivial system and then observing uh, different uh, magnetic topological properties uh, and working. I mean, that will be of utmost important as well. Uh, in designing different material systems, uh, the exposure of magnetic topology and designing different material systems um, to observe different uh, magnetic topological properties is something uh, which is also important. Um, so uh, lastly, I would like to mention that uh, we have been working on uh, quite a few projects. Uh, so one of them is layer dependent evolution of eight states that affect of magnetism and exploration of magnetic topology in low dimension. Um, and um, these are my publications. Uh, so with that, uh, let us thank you. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you. Um, I'm waiting to see if any questions come in to the virtual platform. Um, unfortunately, um, that was way over my um, business administration level college education. So I apologize. Sorry, that was supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> it does not appear we have any questions from the virtual audience. So with that, I will say we are closing um, session YBio9 on topic, topological phenomenon one. Thank you to all our presenters from around the world, um, it seemed this afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. <laughs>